Hey everyone, Thaw Steve here with 1796 Robo Tigers here in the Johnson Division at World Championship. Winners of the Hudson Valley, Tech Valley, and New York Regional as well. Really excited to talk about their amazing robot elevator for the trap and amp, pivoting shooter, and underneath the bumper intake. Really excited to talk about here with our top 24 team on Behind the Bumpers. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Discover how Kettering University students engineer their success with Kettering's amazing co-op employment programs where students earn great pay and gain valuable experience. Those accepted into Kettering University can apply for a robotic scholarship providing up to an additional $5,000 a year in tuition assistance. Head on over to kettering.edu slash first to learn more and apply. Support funds content creators when you sign up for a membership on YouTube Join. You'll get access to special perks like emotes, loyalty badges, and fund members will even get early access to our scheduled videos and more. 100% of this revenue will go back to our correspondents to help recognize their efforts. Click the join button in any YouTube video to pledge your support. Rafael, tell me, talk me about your drivetrain. You, see, you have a drivetrain, a swerve seams, and then you also your intake. Talk me about the All process. Right. So just starting with the swerve, we have a MK4 IM modules with a Krakens on them, both for the drive and the steering. So if you can get closer, you can see pretty much it's just like the normal swerve MK4 IM. Uh, following with the frame, so we pretty much just like took the side, kind of like taking for the intake as well, taking inspiration, kind of like offsetting the frame for it to be kind of like around six, seven inches offset from the swerve in a way. Uh, also for the frame, this is our first year that we actually don't have our frame welded between each other as we found out that it was way easier to replace any parts and any bends that happened throughout competitions. And it's something that actually helped us a lot because in Hudson Valley and many of these competitions, mainly in playoffs, we found out that uh, there were a lot of bends that not only affected the frame, but also our intake as well. So talking about the intake, so if we get a little bit more closer, uh, we went with an under the bumper intake, right? So the, it's almost a full over the bumper, a full frame under the bumper intake. The only thing that is keeping it from being a full uh, under the bumper intake is kind of like this little offset that we have right here with this plate that I like to call it kind of like the Kraken mount plate. Pretty much it's a way for all the gears or all the pulleys to be separated from touching the node or getting kind of like stuck with the node right there. So it's able to transfer the motion and it's able to go from the motor to the different rollers. Talking more about the intake, we have in the bottom sushi rollers and in the top we just have a aluminum bar with in the middle uh, some grip that is able to get the node inside and is able to actually uh, center the node. Something else that I want to point out is kind of like this uh, wedges 3D printed which are mainly used for centering the node independently of whether it's in taken from the sides or it's in taken from the center. So it's able to take it to the tramp that is able to score both in the amp and the trap. Also, just finishing with the intake, is the inside part that pretty much just like takes the node up, like I was talking about, to the tram. Something that I want to point out is kind of like this little, what I like to call it, bananas. We find a lot of like a, a struggle with the tension of the belts, and we actually made them in order to prevent either the bars from bending or from kind of like losing that tension that we wanted to achieve. Now, can, can we see a quick demonstration of your intake? Now, that allows us to hand it off to Makai. Talk to me about your amp and trap mechanism. Seems like it just passed through together. Talk to me about it. Right, so as soon as the node is done passing through the intake, it's sort of in the middleman of our robot, which is our elevator and these three rollers, which we like to call the tramp, which combines our ability to score into the amp and our ability to score into the trap. So starting with the elevator, it's a three-stage continuous elevator rigged entirely through belts inside the tubing. This is a first for our team, as in previous years, we would always rig our elevators through the back end. And in this year, that wasn't viable for us, since a core concept of our robot is being able to have a back pass through to our shooter. So we decided to go with that inside rigging for our elevator. And then the tramp, which is located on the carriage, is what sets the spit out angle for both our amp and our trap. So if you want to raise the amp height, Spit out. That's a basic demonstration of how we would score into the amp. And if you want to run the climb sequence so we can show trap. We start with the climb going up. And then 
throughout sequence. Eventually, we get to trap height. These wheels help us roll on the stage so that we can enter into the flap door and drop into the trap. Now, is this all just run by, it seems like there's a single Kraken, your entire elevator mechanism? Yeah, it's driven entirely by one Kraken. We do the one-to-one -one gear ratio to be able to transfer the bell motion on both sides. One cool thing about the way we actually clamp our belts is that our 3D printer has the carbon fiber option and these belt clamps, which are located on both the bottom and top ends of our carriage are one of the only parts to be carbon fiber infused on our robot. That way, no matter what amount of force is pulled on, those clamps are going to be able to properly tension that belt, making sure that it doesn't stretch too much and that our elevator doesn't get sick. Amanda, talk to me about your shooter. Like Mikhail said, that you, the intake gives it to like the middle of the robot to decide between the amp and the trap or the shooter. Now, talk to me about the shooter. So after coming from Makai's amp, the shooter actually lands on this platform. And in this year's game, we noticed that having a note that spins allows more accuracy and more like it shoots straighter. So we made the, our shooter by having two Krakens. Um, both of these sets of wheels are driven by two uh, Krakens as they provide different speed. And with the different speed, it was able to actually provide the spin for the note. Um, in the back over here, we have these shooter wheel. I mean feeder wheels, and these feeder wheels basically allows um, it creates some acceleration for the note to pass through uh, the shooter wheel or if we want to we can send it back to the tramp and allow it to shoot into the trap or the amp and if you look under oh can you like turn off <laughs> if you look under the uh, the feeder wheel is actually um, driven by this this one belt and by this motor behind and the shooter is actually pivoted on the max spline that is actually connected on the turtle plate. And a fun fact about this turtle plate is that the elevator climb and shooter uh, lies on this turtle, turtle plate. So it makes it easier for us to switch frames if we wanted to. Another cool thing about the shooter is its pivoting mechanism, which is the belt box. Um, this belt box is actually custom made with water jet and 3D printed pulleys. As we noticed that with chains, there's actually a lot of slack and that's why we transitioned into like 3D printing and water jetting pulleys as there's like less slack as we want a lot more accuracy with the shooter and shooting it into the speaker. Now what's the angle that you that your pivot allows you to do with the shooter? Um, the max angle I believe is to be around 50 degrees but when we try to shoot it really depends on where we are in the location right. and that will fall into Let's hand it off to Hyro. Talking about your climb, uh, we saw it earlier. It seemed like there's a bit of scratches on your robot, but also I saw a couple of sensors as well. Talking about the climb mechanism that you have. Yeah, so let's start off with the actually how it's entirely clamped. So this belt actually runs through the entire tube and gets clamped down over underneath these plates. So hypothetically, if we were to take off these plates, you would see a plate that has teeth cut out and those are what's actually uh, clamping, uh, well, hel what helps clamp the belt onto it. And then this plate is basically just covering it. So as you said with the sensor, so all the way down here is where um, the programmers zero the entire climb. So it is actually uh, magnetic. So it uses uh, magnets to determine um, what, like how to zero the climb. And we also it's also run by one motor on each side. And this top pulley isn't, uh, I guess just, helps it with, I guess, the wraparound. And something else we have is, um, I like to call it a bearing block because it holds all the bearings, right? So in each one of these, there's 16 bearings. There's two types. There's half inch bearings on the side, the two inch side, and there's a 0 0.625, 5 eighths bearings on the one inch side. And this basically helps it with the maneuvering of up and down motion. And that's why you can see a lot of scratch marks, as you said earlier. Also, this plate right here on both sides is really thick. Yep. Why is it so thick? Um, so the reason why it's so thick is because we needed enough space for the bearing axle to fit inside the block. Okay. And, and we try to keep it as narrow as possible because, you know, weight. Right. <laughs> weight is a problem. Yeah, that was my main concern. <laughs> yeah, but we did also have a pocketing over here. So we did try to remove some weight over there. And 
Now let's ha hand it off to Jeffrey to talk us about your programming that you have. I see a couple of limelights, the sensors, you have to include that in your programming. Talk to me about it all. Yeah, so first I want to talk about the limelights. So we actually have four limelights on each side of a robot. One on the back, one on the front, one on the right, and one on the left. So all these limelights are used to track April tags so that we could get odometry from a robot. Um, with this odometry, what we were able to do is that we were able to tune the shooter. So basically what we're able to do is that we determine the distance between our robot and then the sensor, I mean, not the sensor, the, and then the speaker. And based off that distance, we're able to pivot the shooter to a certain way. Now, one thing I want to ask about the sensors mm -hmm. is, are you guys, do you guys reset the sensor at the end of the match, before the match? How does the sensor for the climber work? Yeah, so for the climbing sensor, at the when the robot is in its disabled state or when it's like not enabled, is that's when it is zeroing the sensor. So if the robot's disabled and the sensor ever is detected to be true, then that sets it to zero and then that will be our zero state. And well, 1796 Ro Robo Tigers, thank you guys so much for walking us through your amazing robot. Again, congratulations on becoming the top 24 team in our FRC top 25 voting. Really amazing robot. Again, three blue banners as well. You guys have done shown amazing progress. And thank you guys so much for walking us through. And congratulations on your great success. Good luck here in, in Worlds. Thank you. Thank you. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Discover how Kettering University students engineer their success with Kettering's amazing co-op employment programs where students earn great pay and gain valuable experience. Those accepted into Kettering University can apply for a robotic scholarship providing up to an additional $5,000 a year in tuition assistance. Head on over to Kettering.edu first to learn more and apply.